My name is Katherine Urich. I am the relatively new dean of CNAS, which is a College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences at UC Riverside. So it is really my pleasure to welcome you to the first of these many wonderful events. So I hope that you all enjoyed the climate and sustainability fair that we had, despite the rain inside. And I'd like to thank the following sponsors for the fair. So starting with UCR's EDGE Institute, the Office of Sustainability, and the Department of Earth Sciences, and the Riverside STEM Academy High School. I'd also like to thank, just to give a shout out to all the students who presented these really amazing posters. So please join me in congratulating them. It's a very important step that not only we understand what's going on, but that we're able to communicate what is going on and with our Earth. So the theme for this year's lecture series, which is the ninth since the series began in 2009, is sustainability in a time of rapid change, the future of Earth, life, and humanity. This series will consist of four lectures related to sustainability, covering topics of climate change, pollinators, i.e. bees, water supply, and solar energy. So I'd like to acknowledge, I guess, a couple groups here. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the CNAS Science Ambassadors who are serving as ushers tonight. They are in the blue polo shirts throughout the room. Please raise your hands, Ambassadors, and let's thank them. Thank you all. I also want to give a shout out to the folks in the green shirts. Yes, <laughs> yes, you for your great, wonderful presentations. These are our students from Earth Sciences at UCR. So um, going back to our CNAS ambassadors, our science ambassadors, again, thank you for everything that you do for the university as well as for CNAS. These are some of our top undergraduate students who assist the college in many ways, from community outreach to activities such as this. So they really represent the face of our university. So before I introduce our speaker tonight, I would like to get a feel for who is in this audience right now. So how many students do we have in the audience? All right. How many, how many of you are CNAS students? Oh, come on. Be proud. OK. <laughs> yes, good. <laughs> how many of you are CNAS alumni? Good. How many of you are UCR alumni? Excellent. Well, thank you all for joining us here tonight. And how many of you are just here because this is just a really cool topic? <laughs> That's why. <laughs> all right. So thank you all. So you're going to enjoy this lecture tonight. Uh, tonight's talk is entitled Earth Under Fire, How and Why Our Climate is Changing. And this is talk, lecture is going to be given by Assistant Professor Robert Allen. So uh, Dr. Allen is assistant professor in climatology in the Department of Earth Sciences at UCR, University of California, Riverside. He received his bachelor's degree in atmospheric science and his master's degree in applied climatology from, Cli from Cornell University. He then went on to get his PhD in atmosphere, ocean, and climate dynamics from Yale University. His uh, bio is in your program, so I'm just going to very briefly give an outline of what he does. He focuses on climate models, as well as a wide range of observations, generally to improve our understanding of the climate system, including climate variability, land-atmosphere interactions, atmospheric aerosols and short-lived pollutants, and large-scale climate dynamics. I'm sure he's going to give us a much better view of what all <laughs> these words really mean in a few minutes. And I also just have to say, from my perch as the dean of CNAS, Looking at his record of, of academic achievements is really extraordinary. So I was going to say that he's the shining star of one of the <laughs> shining stars, but that's not quite appropriate for Earth Sciences, and so I'm going to re refer to him as one of our diamonds. <laughs> so please <laughs> join me in welcoming uh, Professor Robert Allen. Okay, um, so I'm talking about uh, modern climate change. An outline, so it's going to be a pretty brief uh, outline here. And I'll talk a little bit about um, is the climate changing? Um, if so, why? Um, and we'll look at some future climate projections that are 
going to be based on, on climate models. So I'll talk. Keep going. Um, can you hear me? Yes? Not you guys, but uh, in the back. <laughs> I got two microphones. OK. Yes? Thumbs up? OK. Um, so then I'll talk about some future climate projections, which will be based on uh, climate models. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, what a climate model is. Um, and finally, I'll, I'll conclude on what we can do. So the first thing I'm going to show you is an uh, animation from NASA. Um, and this is going to be showing you the evolution of surface temperatures um, from 1880 to present day. Um, so what this is showing you is it's showing you surface temperature anomalies. Okay? And it's showing you a five-year running mean. So for example, this freeze frame is showing you um, the global surface temperature anomalies over this five-year period from 1880 through 1884. Okay? So I'm going to put this in motion. And what you'll see um, is kind of an evolution of a lot of blue colors, okay, which indicate a relatively cold time period, to yellows and reds, which indicate a relatively warmer time period. Okay. So that animation is a pretty striking example illustrating um, how the climate system is cha has changed over the last uh, 150 years or so. Now, if we were to take a global average of uh, the surface temperature anomalies that I just showed you um, and plot that as a function of time, we would have a graph that looks like this here. Okay, so this is showing you the global average surface temperature anomaly time series from 1850 to present day. And it's showing you four different um, independent um, observational records of the global surface temperature anomaly. So the first thing to note is that all four records are showing you a consistent result. Okay, so all the lines, all the different colored lines are overlapping. Um, if we were to kind of eyeball um, the trend in this time series, um, you could see that the trend is a positive trend. Okay, and that is indicative of warming of the globe over this time period. Um, in terms of some numbers, I've included a bunch of numbers down here. And all of this uh, information comes from um, the IPCC. So the IPCC stands for the Intergovernmental, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And they are the leading body for the scientific assessment of climate change. It's comprised of thousands of scientists from over 100 different countries worldwide. So these are the climate experts, OK? that meet on a, say, five-year um, time interval to assess um, the recent scientific advancements having to do with climate change. So if we focus here on the, uh, um, these, these, these trends over the um, 20th century, we can see that the rate of warming is approximately 0.1 degrees C per decade. Okay? And these are significant trends. Um, but if we focus on the more recent time period, from 1979 to 2012, um, we can see that the values are approximately two to three times larger, okay? something like 0.2 to 0.3 degrees C per decade. And you can see this in the time series. Okay? You can see that the slope of the line here is much, more, is much steeper over the last um, several decades relative to the entire time period. Okay? So this is suggesting that the rate at which our planet is warming is accelerating. Now, to make this point a little bit more uh, clear, um, this graph is showing you um, the five warmest years on record. Okay, and again, um, on record refers to uh, basic, basically the last 150 or so years. So, 2015, which was last year, um, is the warmest year on record over this 150-year time interval. Okay. Um, the next um, 
five warmest years okay, are shown here. So here's 2014, for example, uh, 2010, 2013, 2005, and 2009. So um, the six warmest years on record have all occurred since 2005. Okay? Um, if we zoom out a little bit further, um, 15 of the 16 uh, warmest years on record has, have occurred since 2001. Okay. Now, as a modern climatologist, um, we're kind of um, we're at the mercy of the thermometer uh, temperature record. And again, this only spans about 150 or so years. Um, but we have um, paleoclimatologists that use various climate proxies to infer past climate change over much longer time periods. So this graph is an, is an example of a longer reconstruction of northern hemisphere surface temperature. And this is based on climate proxy data. Um, and what do I mean by climate proxy data? Um, well, this graph in particular is based on things like ice cores as well as tree rings. Okay, so we can use those two things to infer past um, climate change. So this graph is actually quite famous, and it's, it's, uh, it has the, um, the nickname is the hockey stick. Okay, so you can see that it kind of looks like a hockey stick tilted on the side. So if we go uh, to describe this graph, you can see it goes back a thousand years before present. Okay, and again, this is showing you the northern hemisphere surface temperature anomaly. So we can see that um, northern hemisphere um, surface temperatures over much of this record remained relatively stable. Okay, maybe a little bit of a cooling trend over most of the record. But then if we look at the recent warmth, okay, we can see that it's much larger okay, than it was over any time over the last 1,000 years. Okay, so another way of saying this is, is that the warmth over the latter half of the 20th century is unprecedented over the, the last 1,000 years. So what, are, what other evidence do we have that the climate is changing? Okay, so I've just presented a bunch of evidence based on uh, surface temperatures, but we have other independent evidence that supports a warmer planet. Um, a decrease in Arctic sea ice area is another example. So here in the upper right-hand panel, I'm showing you the extent of Arctic sea ice okay, in 1979 during September. So here's Greenland over here. Here's uh, Alaska. Um, and then the bottom panel is showing you um, the Arctic sea ice extent for 2003. Okay, so these are two snapshots, but they're clearly showing you a reduction in the Arctic sea ice area. Now, if we were to look at a time series, which is this graph here on the left, so this graph is showing you the extent of Arctic sea ice from 1979 to present. You can see that there's a large negative trend. Okay, so this graph is telling you that the sea ice extent in the Arctic has significantly declined over the last several decades by about minus 13% per decade. Another thing to note is that the 10 lowest Arctic sea ice area years have all occurred in the last decade. So more independent evidence that the climate is changing and more specifically that the planet is warming. We also have observational evidence that global mean sea level has been increasing. Okay, so the panel here on the left is showing you um, a time series from 1880 to present showing you the increase in global mean sea level. Okay, so over this time period, um, we have about a 20 centimeter increase in global average sea level, or about eight inches. So that may not sound like too much, um, but left unchecked, continued climate change could lead to very large increases in global mean sea level. And you know, the way in which climate change can increase the sea level is two, two, two different ways. Okay? When you melt ice that's on land, well, that water is going to run off and go into the ocean. And it's going to increase the volume of the ocean. Okay? Another way in which climate change can increase uh, global mean sea level is the fact that water, like most substances, expand when heated. So the graph on the right is showing you the amount of ice that Greenland lost over a four-year period from 2004 to 2007. So the volume of ice loss by Greenland over this relatively short time period is equal to the surface area of these 14 states shown here. So for example, here's, uh, here's my home, home state here is New York. Okay? 
Um, so it's, e it's equal to the surface area of these 14 states um, and three feet of, of thickness. Okay, so that's the amount of ice that Greenland has lost over a ver relatively short four year time period. We also have another ice sheet on our planet, Antarctica. Okay, so in 2002, um, the Larsen B ice shelf collapsed over basically a, a couple month time period. So this is showing you the collapse of the Larsen B ice shelf. So here it is um, in January, 30, January of 2002. Here uh, is uh, the start of the collapse a month later. So you can see that the ice is starting to break up. And then just a couple weeks later, the entire ice shelf is disintegrated, as shown here. Okay, and again, this is where the Larsen B ice shelf is. It's on the um, far tip of the West Antarctic Peninsula. So there's been a lot of recent studies, in fact, in the last month or two, um, that have suggested that a small amount of warming is likely going to initiate processes that will result in the destabilization of the entire West Antarctic ice sheet. Right, so basically, the West Antarctic ice sheet is this whole mass here. Okay? And once this process starts, it's essentially impossible to stop it. Okay? And over a period of, say, many centuries to millennia, this will result in an increase in global mean sea level of about three meters. Now, something that I work on um, is kind of the climate effects, uh, well, the climate change impacts on large scale atmospheric circulation. Um, and one, um, one, one component of that that I've been working on is the pho this phenomenon called widening of the tropical belt. Okay, so here's an image showing you um, the average location of the northern hemisphere tropical belt from 1980 to 1984 in blue. And the red is showing you the average boundary of the tropics from 2008 through 2012. Okay, so you can see in both the northern and the southern hemisphere, um, the edge of the tropics has moved poleward. Okay? So this is associated with both an increase in greenhouse gases, which I'll talk more about um, very shortly, as well as other anthropogenic climate forcing agents such as atmospheric aerosols. So if we put all the evidence together, many of, much of which I haven't had time to discuss, um, but is summarized in this chart, um, we have an increase in sea surface temperatures, we have an increase in ocean heat content, we have an increase in sea level, we have an increase in marine air temperature, a decrease in sea ice area, an increase in atmospheric water vapor, an increase in tropospheric temperatures, a decrease in glacier volume on land, and an increase in temperature on land. If we put all that evidence together, they're all consistent with warming of the climate system. And this has led the IPCC, which again is the leading um, body for the scientific assessment of climate change, to conclude that warming of the climate system is unequivocal due, due to the many overlapping pieces of evidence. So, climate's changing, it's getting warmer. Um, why? If we zoom out for a minute and look at the planet from outer space, um, we can apply a, a fundamental principle of physics, which is called energy balance. So the amount of energy going into the planet has to be equal to the amount of energy leaving the planet under a steady state. So the energy coming into the planet is basically sunlight, okay, which is shown here in this diagram by the yellow arrows. Now we know the planet has to radiate that, some of that energy back to space, otherwise the planet would heat up right, forever. So the emitted terrestrial or long wave radiation is indicated by the red. So if we set those two quantities equal to one another, we can solve for the equilibrium temperature of the planet. And when we do that, we get a value of minus 18 degrees C. So that obviously is much colder than the observed global average temperature of 14 degrees C. Okay? And the reason for this difference is, the f is, is because this model does not account for the atmosphere. And more specifically, it does not account for the greenhouse effect. Okay, so the difference between these two temperatures, 14 C and minus 18 C, or about 32 degrees C, um, is attributable to the greenhouse effect. Now, what is the greenhouse effect? Uh, the greenhouse effect refers to um, these gases in the atmosphere, the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide 
is one of those and probably the most important from an anthropogenic perspective. But these gases inhibit the planet's ability to cool off. Okay? They inhibit this, they, they inhibit, they reduce the red arrows. Okay? And you can think of these greenhouse gases as acting like a blanket for the planet. And it's exactly analogous to on a cold winter night, okay, you're cold, so you put a blanket around yourself. Well, that blanket is not providing a source of heat, okay, but yet you, you, you feel warmer, okay, because the blanket is inhibiting your body's ability to cool off. Okay, so the greenhouse gases are acting like the same thing, but for our planet. So let's look at the time um, change in greenhouse gases with a focus on carbon dioxide. So this panel here on the right is showing you the time, time um, evolution of, of CO2 in the atmosphere over the last 10,000 years. So you can see for much of this time period, the atmospheric concentration of CO2 is relatively stable, somewhere around 260 to 275 ppms, parts per million. Um, but then if you look at the most recent time period, you can see that the concentration spikes, okay? And this inset here is showing you um, a zoomed-in view since the Industrial Revolution, okay? So coincident with the timing of the Industrial Revolution, which is when we started to um, combust fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas for our means of energy generation, there was a large increase in CO2. Okay. So this increase in CO2 is due to the combustion of fossil fuels and IPCC, okay, again, leading body for the assessment of climate change, um, attributes um, the main cause of climate change to the increase in atmospheric CO2. Now another point that I want to make is that CO2 has a very long lifetime in the atmosphere. Okay. Tw up to uh, approximately 20% of the CO2 that we emit into the atmosphere is going to stay in the atmosphere for thousands of years. Okay, so this comes back to the fact that um, climate change is essentially irreversible over human timescales. Another point that I would like to make is that uh, the importance of greenhouse gases to climate change is not a new idea. Okay, this is nothing new. Um, this graph is showing you um, back in 1856, um, this guy John Tyndall um, was, the one, was the first to identify the greenhouse, uh, the greenhouse effect of, of carbon dioxide, right? That it was basically opaque to infrared radiation. And then before the 20th century, Savante Arrhenius was the first to quantitatively calculate the amount of global warming associated with a doubling of CO2. Okay, and it turns out that his calculations, you know, over 100 years ago, um, are not that different than modern day calculations. So what other evidence do we have that greenhouse gases are associated with a warmer world? Well, we can go to planets in our solar system, more specifically Venus. Okay, so here's a picture of Venus. Um, and if we look at this energy balance model that I briefly described earlier, um, which does not account for the greenhouse effect, um, we calculate Venus has a surface temperature of 230 Kelvin. Right, which is much below freezing. Um, but the actual observed surface temperature of Venus is 700 Kelvin. Okay? So um, this is consistent with the fact that Venus's atmosphere is primarily comprised of CO2. In fact, it's 97% CO2. So on Venus, um, Venus is characterized by what's known as a runaway greenhouse effect. Okay? So a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere and very hot surface temperatures. We also have additional evidence that comes from the ice core record. So here on the left, we have a scientist that's taking an ice core. Um, and these ice cores are um, really amazing because they offer a very high temporal resolution of many different indirect measures of past climate. So for example, there's a lot of trapped air bubbles um, in these ice cores that are a measure of past um, concentrations of the greenhouse gases. There's also various oxygen isotopes that you can use to back out past uh, ice volume on the continents and indirectly infer, infer past temperatures. So what does the ice core record um, tell us about past uh, climates? Well, this bottom graph here is showing you um, the temperature change over the last 400,000 years in blue. The top panel in red is showing you the same thing, but 
based on, but, but it's CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. So this is showing you four glacial to interglacial cycles. So here's present day, okay? So we're currently in an interglacial period. We have relatively high CO2 and we're relatively warm, okay? If we go back, we see um, a relatively cooler time period with low CO2. And then we reach the, 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 the previous interglacial, okay, the period of warmth, and we can see that there's also a correspondingly high CO2 concentration. So visually inspecting these two diagrams, you see that there's a high correlation between temperature and CO2 based on the ice core record over the last 400 plus thousand years. Okay, so that's another um, piece of evidence that shows that when temperatures were warmer, you had more CO2, and when temperatures were cooler, you had less CO2. We also have climate models. Okay, so climate models are basically a mathematical representation of the climate system. Okay, and they're based on fundamental equations that govern atmospheric and oceanic circulation. Now, you have to divide the planet up into a bunch of grid cells, which is what this uh, diagram here is showing you in both latitude, longitude, as well as height in the atmosphere and depth in the ocean. And then for each of those grid cells, you try to represent all of the important physical processes that are going on, okay? Now, these are very computationally expensive models, and they are run on supercomputers, which are shown down here, okay? Now, we can conduct, uh, basically a climate model is a climate scientist lab. You can con conduct a bunch of controlled experiments using a climate model. And when we do these controlled experiments, um, we get results that look like this. So this top panel is showing you in the gray the global surface temperature evolution, which I've already showed you. And the black here is showing you a model um, reproduction of the time, rate, time change of um, global average surface temperature, but only if the model is forced by natural factors. Okay, so natural factors include things like changes in solar irradiance as well as volcanic eruptions. And you can see um, that the black line and the gray line um, do not correspond highly, particularly um, over the last several decades, since 1960 or so. Okay, the observations are showing um, a, a very strong rate of warming, whereas the model simulation is showing you actually cooling. Now, if you include Okay, all of the anthropogenic forcings in the model, in addition to the natural forcings, you get a plot that looks like this on the bottom. Okay, so now we see the black line and the gray line better correspond. Okay, so this is, this is additional evidence that supports the importance of anthropogenic um, forcing agents, like CO2 and other greenhouse gases, in being able to explain the observed surface temperature evolution over the 20th century. So how about future climate projections? What do they show? Well, before I talk about future climate projections, I first want to discuss these future forcing scenarios. So if you want to project climate into the future, you first have to know the future evolution of the important climate forcing agents, like greenhouse gases. Okay, so you can approximate future um, evolution of CO2 based on assumptions of global population, um, technological innovations, um, as well as consumption and wealth, okay? So what the IPCC has done is develop these, these future emission scenarios, and I've shown you two here, okay? So this is showing you the atmospheric CO2 concentration. The gray, or the, I don't know, brown, is the observed concentration, which I've already shown you, which ends in, in the present day. And then you can see that the, um, the red line is showing you a projection of atmospheric CO2 under a business as usual scenario. Okay, this is also known as RCP 8.5. So you can see under this business as usual scenario, um, by the end of this century, um, atmospheric CO2 concentrations will be approximately 1,200 parts per million. Okay, and the current concentration is 400. Okay, so more, you know, more, a factor of three uh, of an increase. Now the cyan line shown here is what's known as a mitigation scenario, otherwise known as RCP 2.6, okay? So you can see under this, um, this blue um, line, 
the increase in atmospheric CO2 peaks um, before mid-century and then remains relatively stable through the remainder of the century. So this mitigation scenario assumes reduction, very strong reductions in greenhouse gas emissions um, through the 21st century. Now that was the atmospheric concentration of CO2. Obviously the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is going to be a function of our emissions. So I also wanted to show you um, these, force, the, these future emission scenarios that are actually showing you the emissions of carbon. Okay, so again, um, this is CO2 emissions and petagrams of carbon per year. And the red is the business as usual, the RCP, RCP 8.5. And the blue, okay, is the mitigation scenario. Okay, so under the business as usual scenario, we're going from approximately 10 petagrams of carbon per year in present day to 30. Okay, so again, a factor of, of three of an increase. Um, under the mitigation scenario, um, you can see that we peak um, before mid-century, and then we have a gradual reduction in CO2 emissions, such that by around 2070, 2080, we have zero global carbon emissions. Okay, so this is a very ambitious goal, okay, but it turns out that this mitigation scenario is the only scenario that keeps global warming below a 2 degree C threshold. And most climate experts agree that we should keep global warming below this 2 degree C threshold. So on to the future surface temperature projections. Um, these are based on the climate models that I previously introduced and it's based on um, a very large number of climate models. So for example, um, the RCP 8.5 is based on 39 different climate models. So this is showing you that under the business as usual scenario, global mean surface temperature is projected to increase by another 4 degrees C relative to the latter half of the 20th century. Under the mitigation scenario, the blue line in this plot, um, you can see that global mean surface temperature doesn't increase very much, okay? And by the end of the century, um, we, we're, we're, we're below this 2 degree C um, um, climate threshold. So the point here is that um, mitigation is key to um, avoiding what climate scientists refer to as dangerous climate change. And just to make the point again a little bit more clear, what do I mean by mitigation? Um, mitigation is kind of a fancy term that basically refers to a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So how about something a little closer to home? Okay, so this is a, a study um, based on a climate model, um, but actually a very high resolution climate model um, for, for, for the LA basin. And I understand there's a lot of lines on here, um, but we're going to focus on a couple. Um, so we got uh, degree C, this is the warming here, and then we got months here. Oh. A uh, month here on the uh, x-axis, and the black lines are showing you um, the seasonal um, cycle of temperature for the LA basin based on the baseline time period, so based on the latter half of the 20th century. The red lines, okay, are showing you the RCP 8.5, so the business as usual projection by the end of this century, okay, so you can see that the red lines uh, um, are well above all of the black lines. Um, including the, um, the uh, envelope of uncertainty. So um, under this business as usual scenario, future outcomes are well outside the variability envelope in most cases, and this represents a new temperature state. Now if we look at the mitigation scenario, which again are the, the blue colors here, RCP 2.6, um, although this leads to significant warming, um, the warming remains within the variability envelope. So this again is showing you the importance of, of mitigation, okay? The importance of reducing greenhouse gas emissions to keep global warming, or in this case, warming for the LA basin, um, below um, what climate scientists refer to as dangerous levels. Hmm. Okay, so this uh, comes from the same study, 
And this is showing you very hot days per year in Riverside. And very hot day is, qu is, is quantified as a day that exceeds 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Now here on the left, we have the, uh, the baseline. Okay, so this is uh, the number of days, very hot days, over from 1981 through 2000. So on average, um, approximately 60 days per year over the latter half of the 20th century exceed 95 degrees Fahrenheit in Riverside. Now, the next sets of bars represent the climate projections based on business as usual in red and the mitigation scenario in blue. Okay? So here's the middle century. Okay? So we see both um, the red and the blue lead to an increase in the uh, number of very hot days in Riverside. Um, the business as usual scenario leads to a few more, um, but this represents about a 60% increase relative to the baseline. If we, if we continue to look at the end of the 21st century, which is the last set of two bars, um, we can see that the business as usual situation leads to approximately 130 days per year where the temperature exceeds 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? So that's, uh, that's a very large increase. And maybe another way of, of, of communicating this is basically this means that about one, one out of every three days per year um, is going to exceed 95 degrees Fahrenheit in Riverside. Okay? Um, so clearly, this business as usual scenario um, is going to lead to a very hot uh, Riverside. Okay? Um, the blue, okay, you can see the blue, the mitigation scenario at the end of the century, um, is essentially giving you the same number of exceedances as the blue um, bar during the middle of the century. So again, this is showing you the importance of mitigation. Okay? Um, it's also suggesting that some additional climate change is inevitable, okay, as represented by you know, this blue bar here relative to here. Um, but mitigation is very important. Okay? If we want to um, not live in a world where one out of every three days per year in Riverside exceeds 95 degrees Fahrenheit, then we have to start reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. So a couple other um, impacts of climate change I'll talk about now. Um, so this is something that I work on. Um, and what this figure is, is implying is that uh, um, a warmer world may be associated with an exacerbation of, of air pollution. Okay, so the panels on the left are showing you um, the multi-model mean percent change in three different aerosol species. Okay, so here's sulfate, here's black carbon, and then here's primary organic matter. So these three aerosol species are all components of air pollution. And what the diagram is showing you is that pretty much the entire planet is experiencing an increase in these three aerosol species. So all the, all the, uh, the non-blue colors represent an increase, right? So the yellows and the reds represent a, um, a, an increase in response to a warmer world. Now if we zoom in, for example, over the United States for sulfate, Okay, so this top panel here, um, the multi-model mean are sh is suggesting an increase of between 15 to 25 percent for this one um, air pollution species. And, you know, that, that's, that's one component, but it turns out that, you know, pretty much all of the models agree that this will be the response, okay, that there will be an increase in air pollution in response to climate change. And this is represented by this, this second set of, of of three panels, and the dark red is indicating 100% model agreement on a positive increase in air pollution. Now something, um, an additional um, impact of climate change that's maybe a little bit more uncertain, um, but likely will have the largest impact on society is, an, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a change in extreme weather events, okay? And most um, climate scientists and climate research suggest that extreme, many extreme weather events will become either more extreme, okay, or more frequent, okay? And some examples of that, I've included several here. Um, some examples of that are wildfire outbreaks, for example, in Southern California, okay? So this diagram here is showing you a MODIS satellite image of several wildfires burning during 2003. Okay, so many climate scientists um, and climate research suggests that uh, a warmer world will be more conducive um, to wildfires. 
we also have an increased frequency of both droughts, okay, as well as floods. Now, we all know that California has been in a very severe drought the last four years, um, and by some measures, an unprecedented drought. Okay, so this diagram here is illustrating the most recent uh, um, drought in California. So pretty much the entire state is in some form of drought, with most of the state in the severest category of drought, which is the dark red color. Okay, so it's likely that continued um, climate change and global warming um, is going to create conditions that um, lead to either um, a worsening of drought or an increased frequency of drought. Now, if that's not bad enough, um, it's also likely that climate change is going to lead to the opposite extreme. Okay, so the opposite extreme of drought is flooding. Okay, and in Southern California and along the Pacific Coast, um, a lot of our extreme precipitation events are associated with, with what's called an atmospheric river. Okay, so here in this panel, we have a satellite image showing you the water vapor. Okay, and this is showing you um, an, a, a, an atmospheric river which is shown here in this green, which is basically um, transport of moisture from the lower latitudes, the tropics, um, up into the mid-latitudes along the Pacific coast. Okay? Um, we also have the potential for changes in natural modes of climate variability. And the most dominant mode of climate variability um, is ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation. So we know that El Nino has a large impact on weather in Southern California. And many climate scientists and climate research suggest that these extreme El Ninos will likely to be, are likely to become a more permanent fixture in a warmer world. Um, and that's likely going to lead to flooding in Southern California, as well as in other parts of the world. And finally, um, we have hurricanes or tropical storms. Okay, so the bottom right-hand panel is showing you an image, a uh, satellite image of Superstorm super Sandy. Okay, so Superstorm Sandy uh, basically made landfall along the New, New Jersey coast and flooded a lot of New Jersey as well as parts of New York City. So a lot of climate change research suggests that the intensity of these tropical cyclones or hurricanes um, will increase as the planet warms. So finally, um, you know, what can we do? Okay? Um, well, basically, um, we need to reduce our carbon footprint. Okay, and you know your carbon footprint is basically a fancy term that uh, associate basically it's an association of the amount of carbon emissions that each of us are responsible for. Okay, so the products that you consume, um, the food that you eat, um, your transportation. Okay, basically all of your activities are associated with some amount of carbon emissions. Okay, if you were to add all that up, that gives you your carbon footprint. Okay, so the goal here is to reduce our carbon footprint. And many, many ways of doing this, you can walk or bike instead of drive, you can take public transportation, you can carpool, um, you can adopt energy efficiency such as switching to LED lighting, um, buying fuel efficient vehicles, um, using Energy Star appliances. Um, now another kind of thing that we, 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 we can do um, is to support renewable energy sources such as wind and solar power. Um, or new technologies that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So an example of a new technology that reduces greenhouse gas emissions is carbon capture and storage, CCS. So you're still burning coal, but you're capturing the CO2 before it's released into the atmosphere. Now, something that I try to communicate is that if we are to, we, if we are to follow along the mitigation trajectory, this, this blue line that I've been talking about, this RCP 2.6, we need to start reducing CO2 emissions now, such that by 2075, 2080, we have essentially zero global emissions of CO2. So the only way that that's going to happen is by this bottom red box, okay? And that's the emission reductions necessary to stabilize the climate system will require collective coordinated, coordinated actions by societies, plural, not just the United States, but all societies on the planet, um, as a whole, okay? So implicit in that statement is basically um, um, supporting, um, for example, politicians that support action on, on, on climate change. And with that, I will take questions. Thank you.
have time for a few questions. I would ask if you do have questions to raise your hand and we'll have your CNAS ambassadors give you the microphone. We are videotaping this uh, discussion, so I'd ask uh, Professor Allen to repeat, repeat the, the question. question. Questions? Student group over here, we know you have a question. What does the change in, in climate control have to, or what does our breathing have to do with the climate control change? If we do not do anything, will people have trouble breathing by the end of the century? I don't know. Um, okay, so the question had to do with, I think, the impact of climate change on our ability to breathe. So, like, like asthma-related diseases, is that? Um, yeah. So uh, one of the one of the the panels that I showed you suggested that um, a warmer world is going to be associated with an increase in air pollution. Um, so that would imply, perhaps, um, um, more cases of say asthma or other lung-related dise diseases associated with air pollution. Yes. What do you think caused the rise and fall you know, of the three, the three rises and falls uh, 400,000 years ago? Yeah, so the question is, what causes the um, glacial interglacial oscillations in the ice cores, right? Um, this has to do with changes in orbital variations of our planet. Um, so our planet um, orbits the sun, so there is um, an eccentricity how circular our orbit is um, around the sun. Um, we also have a tilt to our axis. Um, we also ha have something called precession, um, which if you ever played with a, uh, a top, a spinning top, so you spin this top and it spins around kind of like our planet on its axis, but at the same time it also has this wobbling motion. Okay, so our planet does the same thing. Okay, and those three characteristics of our orbit, precession, tilt, and eccentricity, um, are not constant. Okay? They vary over, say, tens of thousands to one hundred thousands of year time scale. And they have an impact on the amount of solar radiation at the top of the atmosphere. And it's thought that this is the main driver for these glacial and interglacial cycles. You discussed the importance of a reduction of carbon dioxide. What about methane? And are there any other greenhouse gases besides carbon dioxide, basically? Yes, there are many greenhouse gases. I have, in the interest of time, I focused on carbon dioxide. Um, carbon dioxide is the most important um, greenhouse gas from an anthropogenic perspective. Um, the second most important is methane. And the third most important is nitrous oxide. Um, there are many more, um, but those three are, are, are the most important. And methane has received a lot of attention lately, um, partially because, um, well, I don't know if people have been looking at the news, but there are some several hundred methane hotspots leaks in the LA basin that previously were unknown. Um, so yes, there are other greenhouse gases that are important besides uh, carbon dioxide. Um, for the mitigation model, is that based on a best case scenario or is that based on what we're currently capable of doing to reduce the emissions? So is that even something we can do? Yeah, so the question was how feasible is the mitigation scenario or the, the RCP 2.6? Um, well, it's, it's feasible, um, but there's going to have to be a desire and a will to follow that trajectory of CO2 emissions. And currently, um, that desire doesn't appear to exist. Um, I mean, in the last, uh, say, a uh, couple of years, um, there has been some more agreement um, in terms of climate change uh, policy between the United States and China. So the United States and China are the two main emitters of greenhouse gases. 
And both of those countries have to be on board with any climate change policies. Um, so the good news, at least, is that in the last year or two, um, both of those countries have come to a better um, um, agreement on some of these, uh, at some of these climate change meetings, like the one in Paris last year. You mentioned uh, capturing carbon. What happens to it once it's captured? Um, yeah, so the question had to do with uh, carbon capture and storage and where the carbon goes when it's captured. Um, basically, you uh, liquefy it and you can put it in an underground aquifer. And this technology exists. Um, there is a carbon capture and storage plant off the coast of Norway that has been in operation since 1993. Um, so this is a technology that uh, exists today, and it's something that we could implement to start to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the question was, why are we not reducing our uh, greenhouse gas emissions now? Um, and actually, the United States um, in the last, uh, say, five to ten years has reduced um, our, we have reduced our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this is primarily, um, um, it's, it's primarily due to the fact that we've switched um, from coal um, to natural gas. Okay? And natural gas has a smaller, it releases less, um, uh, less greenhouse gases when you burn it relative to coal. Now, this is good news, um, but other countries aren't doing this. So it's more than just us, right? It has to be all the countries, and more specifically, the really big emitting countries like, like China, for example, and, and India, and Brazil, and Europe. Join me in thanking Professor Allen.